Well, hi there, folks. It's Paulie here in uh, Impromptu Garden Theatre. So, I've had some um, disturbing news. Uh, you will have seen, hopefully, I did a review some time ago of one of my favourite games of all time, Member of the Petal Throne, which was by Professor M. A. R. Barker. Now, this game was very formative to me personally. It was the first role-playing game I really played. Uh, it was the first campaign I ever played. It completely lit up my world in the 70s in, in high school. Um, it was also the world's first published role-playing games setting. It was TSR's second game. They did Dungeons and Dragons and then they did EPT. Um, in various variants, EPT has remained constantly in print. Uh, there have been other games which have taken the setting and used their own um, rules to create it. Still in play, I'm still playing it, or I was. So news came through that M.A.R. Barker had, as it turns out, published a pro-Nazi, anti-Semitic, racist novel under a pseudonym. Uh, this is bad. It was not a joke. Um, it wasn't done in fun. It was done to seriously push Nazi agendas and show, you know, how it can be done right, how that Jewish question can be solved, and how we can just get back to, you know, racial purity again. But wait, it gets worse. So it turns out, there was the, um, a journal was put out. The JHR, Journal of Historical Revision. Ah, uh, revisionism. I'm a historian, revisionism is, um, yeah, it's the cardinal sin, where we rewrite history to turn it into something we feel is better. Forget the facts, let's just do what's good. Oh, this wasn't just any magazine. No, this was the magazine that essentially formulated and pushed Holocaust denialism. And M.A.R. Barker edited it, sat there on the editorial board of it, and the institute of which this was the published journal under his own name. Um, now this was published all through the um, the 90s. It was the rallying point for the resurgent Nazi movement. This is what unified in pre-internet days individual right-wing hate-filled crazy lunatics and made them feel that they had a community. Um, this was seriously seriously pushing an agenda of genocide, of murder, of, you know, racial purity, right wing, smash the left, kill those who oppose you, all that cool stuff. Pauses for car. So, okay, we've had some problems in recent years with many creators unmasking themselves as basically toxic individuals. J.K. Rowling is a perfect example. Rowling's work on Harry Potter was obviously beloved by many. As a human being, she's a sorry excuse for an organism. And her outspoken, dedicated attacks against the trans community, of whom I am one, uh, has caused untold misery for thousands of people across the world. Under the legitimization that her fame gives her, she has been able to push her agenda politically. Uh, the UK has decided that um, she makes a great flagship to launch anti-trans legislation. So kids are being bullied, kids are suiciding, people are being denied medical care that they want, misery, pain, death, and people are feel they can get away with basic, you know, gay bashing and trans bashing out in the streets because, you know, author of Harry Potter says this is fine. This stuff causes real harm. This is leagues beyond that. In her defense, Rowling just wants trans people to not exist. She doesn't particularly advocate murdering them in the streets. A Nazi advocates murdering Jewish people in the streets. No ifs, no buts. There is no acceptable level of Nazism within any group or society. Period. Okay, so I've tried not to be...
political on this channel um, because I'm trying to be a voice for role-playing games. However, a political statement is a statement that is contentious. Nazis are bad is not a contentious statement. It is. It is an acceptable norm of belief. Nazis are bad. Ergo, one who is a Nazi is bad. So, can you separate the art from the artist? Now, this is a, uh, a difficult question. Oh, if only there was someone with a degree in like ethical philosophy. Oh wait, here's one. Um, okay. Let us just say that what we accept under this sort of cloak of I can separate the art from the artist tells us a lot about ourselves and tells us other people a lot about ourselves. If I can tolerate the artist because I like their stuff, god damn it, it says that I have acceptable levels of tolerance for that person's belief. I'm willing to overlook it a bit because the two are never separated. Oh, Joanne doesn't do that much damage with her anti-trans stuff. I'll keep reading Harry Potter stuff and so on. So, in essence, there are three basic reasons why you would drop consuming someone's material once they've been asked, unmasked as a, a toxic person. There's, there's profit, there's perception, and there's platform. So profit. You don't want the toxic individual to profit from the fruits of you know, their horrible, horrible attitudes. That would be why you wouldn't run out and buy Harry Potter books. In the case of someone who's long dead, they do not personally profit from it. So in this case, profit is not a motive. We're not denying a, a dead man you know, royalties and just saying, so that's gone perception now perception is very very personal is the person's creative output now forever tainted for you by what you know now in some cases it can be quite direct the person's attitudes absolutely inform the creation rereading the tech Mel material i can see hints I think rereading it with a different eye will suddenly make me go, oh, as I perceive some interesting kind of ethno state themes running through it. But it's a personal choice. Is it forever tainted to you in your perception? Can you play this game without hearing that horror going through it? I must say, for myself, I can't. It's a bright and sunny day in Jakala as you pilot your little boat through the canals. The sun is shining and you can hear someone singing praises to the, uh, the gods from one of the mighty ziggurats that overtowers the canal. A beautiful day, made all the more beautiful by the complete lack of Jewish people wandering past you on the streets because before man went to, to space, oh, he, he's ensured that racial purity came first. This is what's going to be running through my damn head. All right, so we have that personal choice. Last one is platform. Does this person have the ability to use their fame or leverage the property as a platform to leverage their horrible, horrible views? Again, the JK Rowling problem. Yes, she uses her fame to do this. This is a dead man we're talking about here. Surely he cannot use this to push his platforms as well. Now here's an interesting problem. Others can push that for him. There are people lined up to stand on that platform and to use this as a means of advancing their agendas. There is a vile element in modern role-playing gaming who have been trying their damnedest to shove their way into gaming spaces and essentially establish particularly old-school rules communities as right-wing spaces where trans people are not welcome, where gay people are not welcome. They are pretty dedicated to this. Um, they will often cover themselves by saying, everyone's welcome at our table. Yes, but diverse people sure as hell aren't invited. And the rhetoric on their 
chat boards on their Facebook pages, on their Twitter feed speaks absolutely for itself. So to these people, to have one of the original game designers who created one of the very first role-playing games coming out as an actual Nazi, that is gold. That is magnificent. They have prayed to whatever beast pig things these creatures worship for a stroke of luck like this to happen. They can basically push this. See? The core of the game has always been pushed by mighty right-wing Nazi people. Um, it is a... Uh, it is a space for us, not for you. This makes it much harder to push back against, you know, face it, Nazi elements in gaming. Um, and it makes it difficult if we continue to sort of celebrate, unfortunately, the Tecumel properties and so on. So the platform test, I feel, is positive. This man's work can be used as a platform to create harm. We can fight against that, you know, but part of that fight is to push that property away. Um, look, I'm... I knew Barker. Um, he was my mentor in many ways. As a, as a young kid who discovered role-playing games, I wrote straight to the guy to say how amazing this was and how it had lit up my world and how I was... I'd been a war game, but now I was studying other cultures. He wrote back and said, look, do it, go out there, study, be a game designer, get those sister degrees, become an author. And that was an amazing, empowering thing, you know, to a 15, 16 year old kid. And I remained in touch with the man till his dying days. Um, so this is very personal to me. It's, I don't say lightly, I have to turn away from this property. Um, but I think it does say a lot about us as to what we will tolerate within the people whose work we enjoy. There is no tolerable level of Nazism. I cannot enjoy this. I have set myself up in many ways for decades as a spokesperson for role-playing games. I've appeared on TV, I've appeared in magazines and newspapers, um, talking up the community. So as such, I really cannot embrace works that have sprung from such a poisoned well. Um, look, it's entirely up to you guys what you do, but that's my position. I know the guys who run the Tecumel Foundation. Um, many of them are close friends because you know, we all knew the guy that wrote it. I know this is a really difficult time for them. They have to figure out what the hell they're going to do now. And there are things they can do to try and mitigate. They can try and maybe do new editions of the game where the profits go to, uh, you know, Holocaust memorials, these sorts of things. Those are the correct actions for them to do. Um, those are noble things for them to do. Uh, and I sincerely hope they do it. But guarding this property against becoming a pulpit for the the alt-right will be very difficult in some cases it might just be better to just let the podium collapse